Today, we're going to talk about uh, absolute or global extreme values and local um, extreme values as well. So first thing we're going to look at is what we call absolute extrema. So if we have a function that has any domain, it could be all real numbers or it could be some restricted domain from zero to pi, for example, like we're looking at here, the absolute maximum value on that domain occurs if or at a value c, if the function is always less than or equal to the value of f of c for all of the x in the domain. And likewise, the absolute minimum occurs if the function is always greater than or equal to the value of f of c at that point. Um, and we're going to notice that these are greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, which means that we can have multiple locations in which the absolute maximum or absolute minimum of a function can occur. So we're going to start first by looking at the cosine function in red here that we've restricted the domain to zero to pi. And the absolute maximum value for the cosine function on this interval is just going to be one because that's the largest y value in that interval. And we would say that it occurs at x equals zero. And the absolute minimum would be the value all the way down at the bottom down here of negative one at x equals pi. For the sine curve, or we've restricted the domain also to zero to pi, the one in blue, we have an absolute maximum of one right up here at the point pi over two, one. So we'll say it has an absolute max of 1 and x equals pi over 2. And it has an absolute minimum on this interval of 0. But this time we'll note that that occurs both here at x equals 0 and here at x equals pi. And just because it occurs twice doesn't mean that it's not the absolute minimum. It's still the absolute minimum. We'll just note that it occurs at x equals 0 and x equals pi. And one of the important things to remember for my test and for the AP test is that if they're asking for the absolute max or the absolute min, or later on a local max or a local min, they want to know the y value. Right? These are y values. If they ask you where it occurs, those are the x values that I've listed alongside our actual maxima or min. So here we have the function f of x equals x squared. And we're going to look at what the absolute max and absolute min or the absolute extrema for this function is on four different um, domains. So the first one we're going to look at is the domain of all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. And so on this domain, we can see that the lowest possible value for our function is zero, that occurs at the vertex of our parabola, with an absolute min of zero at x equals zero. But because this function we know goes up towards infinity on both the left and the right, if it goes to negative infinity and infinity, there is not going to be an absolute max. We won't even say that it is infinity. We'll just say there is no absolute If we restrict the domain over here to the closed interval from 0 to 2, I no longer care about any of this over here. We're just looking between those two black points that I have now indicated. The largest x, or sorry, largest y value that we have here is y equals 4. So that's going to be our absolute max. An absolute max of four, and we're going to say that occurs at x equals two. And our absolute min is still zero, and that still occurs at x equals zero. Now, in this case, we restrict the domain to the half open interval where we're not including x equals zero, but we are including two. We now have an open circle there at the origin 
and our endpoint of the interval there is the 0.24, we're still going to have the same absolute max. So we have an absolute max of four at x equals two. But in this case, as we get closer and closer to x equals zero, we approach x equals zero from the right-hand side, we're getting closer and closer to a y value of zero, but we never get to that y value. And unlike when we dealt with limits where we'd say the limit was zero, we still, um, we still don't reach that point, and therefore there isn't actually a minimum value there. I can get as close to zero as I want. Like when we talked about with limits, we could get to point zero 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 one or even closer. But so regardless of how close we say we've gotten, there's always a another y value that's a little bit smaller than that that's closer. So we have no absolute max. And on the last one here, where we're restricting the domain to the completely open interval zero the two, where we have no endpoints here, we should be able to see that the same thing applies as in the previous one, we had no absolute min. We can't quite get to zero as we approach zero from the right, and we can't quite get to four as we approach two from the left, and therefore there is no absolute max or minimum. So this one doesn't have an absolute max or an absolute min. The extreme value theorem is going to be really important to us, and it's actually really important in proving a lot of theorems later on in the course. Um, the extreme value theorem is pretty straightforward. It says if you have a function f that's continuous on a closed interval, on some interval from a to b, then f must have both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on that interval. So if we look at the first graph we've got here, so we're kind of going up and then back down and then back up between A and B. We have an absolute maximum right here, and we have an absolute minimum right here, both on interior points of the domain of that function. But it was a continuous function from A to B, so it was guaranteed to have that absolute max and that absolute min. Here in the second one, our absolute min actually occurs at the first endpoint, and the absolute max occurs on the interior of the domain. In the third one, we have the absolute minimum on the interior of the domain, but the absolute max at an endpoint. And in the fourth one, the absolute max and the absolute min both occur at endpoints of the domain of that function. In the last one down here, as we have open circles at A and B, this function is not continuous on the closed interval from A to B, even though it is defined, defined because we've got these points right in here at the end, but it's not continuous from A to B, and therefore it isn't guaranteed by the extreme value theorem that there's an absolute max and an absolute min on that interval. And in fact, there, in this case, is not. That's not to say that it's not possible for them to have, for a, for a non-continuous function to have an absolute max and an absolute min, but it's just not guaranteed by the extreme value theorem. One of the biggest things that the AP test is going to be concerned about is finding local extrema. And, and a lot of what we need to do for this unit, for our applications of the derivative, is find local maxima and local minima of functions. So the same basic logic applies for local maxima and minima as it does for absolute maxima and minima. The only difference being that the local max or the local min doesn't have to be the largest or the smallest point on the entire domain of the function. It just has to be the largest or the smallest value on some open interval surrounding that point. So if we look at this graph that we've got drawn here, at point B, at x equals B, we've got a local max, because we could pick some open interval surrounding B where it's the largest value. And it has the largest value at B. The same with D. 
at x equals d, we've also got a local maximum. And in fact, for this portion of the domain, we can see that d is also an absolute maximum, which tells us that sometimes these are shared values. Uh, we have a local minimum at c, but it is not an absolute minimum because we can see that at a, the value of the function is less than it is at c. And important, um, another piece of important information is that all closed endpoints will also be a local max or a local min. So both point A, the point at x equals A, and the point at x equals E are local minima as well, because on the open interval on one side of it, the function is larger than the value at A or at B. And we can see that at x equals A, we also have an absolute minimum. And that would guarantee that we must have an absolute minimum, which we do at x equals a, and an absolute minimum, like we do at x equals d, because of the extreme value here. So if we kind of put together what we've been thinking about here, we can we can see that a function can only have a local maximum or a local minimum at some interior point of its domain if the derivative doesn't exist or if the derivative is zero at that x value. We call points where the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined critical points. And this is a really important term for you to be familiar with. Critical values or critical points are x values at which your derivative either doesn't exist or your derivative equals and so if we are looking for absolute maxima or minima of a function on a closed interval, we're always going to have to check both critical points or critical values, so anywhere where the derivative is zero or doesn't exist. And then we also have to really um, be careful to remember to check the endpoints. And that's one of the most commonly missed things on the AP test because we're going to spend a lot of time figuring out when the derivative is zero and when the derivative is undefined. And it's really easy to forget to go back at the end and check if you had a closed interval. Because if you had a closed interval, you've got to check the endpoints. As we saw earlier, the absolute max or the absolute min of a function can occur at the endpoints. Right? Or we might have it occurring to the max at an endpoint or the min at an endpoint, whereas the or vice versa, the other one is at an interior point. But it's really important that you remember to check the inputs. So we're going to see if we can find the absolute max and the absolute minimum of f of x equals x to the two-thirds on the interval negative two to three. So the first thing we'll do is take a first derivative, f prime of x, and that's just a power rule, two-thirds x to the negative one-third. And we'll rewrite this as two over three times the cube root of x. And we'll note that f prime of x equals zero. Well, the only way for a fraction to equal zero is if the numerator is equal to zero. Our numerator is two. Therefore, f prime will never equal zero. So we're going to ignore that part of it. And then we'll say, OK, f prime of x is undefined or doesn't exist if the denominator of that fraction was equal to zero. So we'll say 3 times the cube root of x equals 0. Well, the only way for 3 times the cube root of x to be 0 is if x is equal to 0. So this right here is a critical value. And it's the first of three values that we need to check to see which one is the absolute max and which one is the absolute min. The other two come from over here at our endpoints. So if we just make a little chart over here, we can say that when x equals negative 2, f of x is equal to, um, it's just negative 2 to the 2 thirds power. And negative 2 to the 2 thirds power is just the cube root of 4. And at x equals 0, f of x ought to be 0 to the 2 thirds power, or just 0. Um, 
and that at x equals three, our other endpoint, f of x is three to the two thirds, which is the cube root of nine. And the smallest of those values is zero. So we'll note that we have an absolute min of zero, and it occurs. It didn't ask for where it occurs, but we're going to state it anyway. It's an absolute min of zero at x equals zero. And then we should be able to tell that the cube root of nine is larger than the cube root of four. So we'll say it has an absolute max on this interval of the cube root of nine at x equals three. And that's our final answer for that one. This time for the function that we're given, um, we're again asked to find the extreme values, but we're not given a specific interval for the function. Um, we're not restricting its domain. So it just, um, it's just asking us what are the extreme values of this function on its domain. So the first thing we'll need to do is figure out what its domain is. Um, we know that the denominator of a fraction can't be zero. So anything that makes the denominator that zero would restrict uh, be a restriction from the domain. And anything that makes it inside the square root a negative value would also be restricted. So effectively, what that tells us is that 9 minus x squared has to be greater than 0. Because if it's less than 0 or if it's equal to 0, we get um, either a square root of a negative or we get 1 divided by 0, both of which are undefined. So this is just telling us that x squared must be less than nine, which means that x must be less than three, or x must be greater than negative three. Um, so any value between negative three and three, non-inclusive of the endpoints, should give us a, a actual point on the graph of this function. So we'll note first off that this, the interval from negative three to three, is not a closed interval. So there's not going to be any endpoints that we need to check. So all we really need to do is just take the derivative of this, find its critical values, and then we should be able to make a statement about what the absolute max and min are based on those critical values. So we could rewrite one over root nine minus x squared as nine minus x squared to the negative one half power. And if we were to do that, we can just use the chain rule. This is u to the negative one half. So our derivative will become negative one half times nine minus x squared to the negative three halves times the derivative of nine minus x squared, which is just negative two x. And we'll notice right away that we can cancel the negative in front of the one half and the negative in front of the two x. We can also cancel the one half with the two, which just ends up making our derivative equal to x over nine minus x squared to the three halves power. Now, at this point, we need to see when this equals zero and when this is undefined. So first off, this is equal to zero, pretty obviously, if the numerator is zero, which is x equals zero. But it would be undefined any time that the denominator was equal to zero, or any time that the whole thing was undefined, which would mean that we were um, taking the square root of a negative. But we'll note that anything that makes nine minus x squared to the three halves undefined or makes it zero also makes our original function zero because, or, or under, makes our original function undefined. And thus all of the, uh, all of the values that might make this happen are not actual domain values of the function. And a critical value has to be domain value of the function. And so the only critical value we have that makes any sense is x equals zero. And then the question becomes, what's happening 
for this function on the other sides of zero. So we know that we have a local min, or sorry, an absolute max or an absolute min of zero, uh, or not of zero, but at x equals zero. Uh, but we just have to then figure out if it's a max or a min. But we also need to find the value. So let's do f of zero first. f of zero is one over the square root of nine minus zero, or just one third. So we know that at zero, it's one third. And we know that on either side of this, it either needs to be increasing um, up towards infinity on both sides of it, or going down towards, towards negative infinity. So we could pick a number that we know how to deal with really nicely. Let's say if x equals the square root of 5, or the negative square root of 5, f of x then equals 1 over the square root of 9 minus 5, or it equals 1 half. And so we can see that at values to the left and to the right of x equals 0, our function is actually getting larger. It's going from 1 third up to 1 half. And so we can say that at one or at x equals zero, the value of one third must be an absolute minimum. And we can take a quick look at the graph of this on Desmos to make sure that we're right. We've got one divided by the square root of nine minus x squared. And we can see that at x equals zero, we get one third of the value. And that is our absolute minimum. The function is increasing over here to the right and it's decreasing from the left as we get down towards x equals zero. And that must be the absolute minimum. And if we zoom out a bit, we can see that this thing is just going to keep going up and up and up and up forever. So, there is no absolute max. And that's okay. We weren't guaranteed for there to be an absolute max for this function because we didn't have a closed interval. It's very important to remember also that not all critical points end up representing an extreme value. So if I were to take the function y equals x cubed, take its derivative, I'd get 3x squared. And if I try to set that equal to 0, we'd get x equals 0 is a location where we might have a max or a min. But what do we know about x cubed? Well, we know y equals x cubed just kind of looks like this, right? It doesn't have an absolute max or an absolute min. So just because you find a critical point doesn't guarantee that that's the location of a max or a min, but it could be. The same thing goes on over here. Y prime is one third X to the negative two thirds, which never equals zero, just like the other one. It was never undefined, but this is undefined at X equals zero. But the cube root of X looks like this and also doesn't have to open that or not. So just be careful. Um, the way we're going to check to see if it actually does is eventually by uh, making some sign checks. So let's see if we can find the extreme values of this piecewise defined function. f of x is equal to 5 minus 2x squared. If x is less than or equal to 1. And it's equal to x plus 2 if x is greater than 1. So we'll start by taking each piece of it separately and seeing if it's got any critical values. So on x less than or equal to 1, f prime of x is equal to just negative 4x, which is never undefined, but is equal to 0 when x is 0. So there's one critical value for us to investigate. And then on x greater than 1, our derivative is just equal to 1, which is never 0 and never undefined. 
So it would appear at first glance that we only have one possible critical value, but it's really important that we also take into account what's going on at x equals one, because the derivative could very well be undefined at x equals one. Um, the quickest way to check is to see if the function is even continuous at x equals one. So I would investigate a limit as x approaches one from the left of f of x. Find that that's five minus two times one squared, or three. And then a limit as x approaches one from the right of f of x, which is just one plus two, or three. So the function is continuous there, which means that it could have a derivative there. We just need to then figure out if the derivative f prime when we approach one from the left and f prime when we approach one from the right also have the same value. So for the first one, at x equals one, this is negative four. And at x equals one for this one, we end up with one. Does negative four equal one? Well, clearly no. Therefore, f prime of x is undefined at x equals 1. And we must have a critical value at x equals 1 as well. So we have x equals 0, and we have x equals 1 as our critical value. And so now we can go in, and we can say, well, what's f of 0? And what's f of one? So if we look at f of zero, f of zero is five minus two times zero squared, or just five. And f of one is just five minus two times one squared, or three. So we know that x equals zero, we're at a larger value than we are at x equals one. Uh, but that doesn't guarantee that these are absolute extrema. So we also have to think about what's happening to each of these functions as x goes towards infinity or negative infinity. So as x goes towards infinity, our function takes on x plus 2, which is approaching infinity. And as x approaches negative infinity, our function takes on 5 minus 2x squared, which is 5 minus 2 times infinity squared, or 5 minus infinity, which 5 minus infinity is negative infinity. So if on one side the function is going down to negative infinity, and the other side is going up to positive infinity, we're certainly not going to have any uh, absolute maxima or minima. So let's just take a second to think about what this function looks like. If we have 5 minus 2x squared, as we go from negative infinity to 1, and as we said, we know that at x equals 0, the value of our function is 5, and at x equals 1, it's 3. So here's 5, and here's 3. And here's one. We know we're going to have a point here and a point here. And this is a downward facing parabola. And we don't necessarily need a perfect graph. Um, we could, if we wanted to, say that we know that the location of the vertex of this parabola ought to be at x equals negative b over 2a, which would be 0 um, over Sorry, negative in there, negative zero over two times negative two, which is clearly just zero. So we know that the vertex is at zero. So our function kind of looks like this and goes down towards negative infinity. And then at one, we pick up and we are x plus two, which just is going to look like this. So we can see from a little quick sketch that we have no absolute max or min but that we do have a local max of 5 at x equals 0, 
and we have a local min of three at x equals one. And we've got just uh, one more function that we're going to look at today. We've got the natural log of the absolute value of x over one plus x squared. So this one's going to get uh, a little bit more complicated, especially by that absolute value. So the first thing we need to think about before we even consider dealing with the absolute value is what makes this thing um, undefined. Right, what is the domain of this function? So we can take the natural log of any positive value, but no negative values, which negative values aren't going to be a problem because everything inside of here is inside of an absolute value. But the other thing we can't take the natural log of is zero. So really, we need to see when does x over 1 plus x squared equal zero. Well, I think that's pretty clear that that is when x is equal to zero. So we know that the only restriction on the domain of f of x is going to be zero. So our domain is now negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity. And if we think about this, um, if x is greater than zero, what uh, what we have inside the absolute value, x over 1 plus x squared, is going to be a positive number. Right? Because 1 plus x squared is always positive, regardless of the value of x. And if x is positive, then the numerator is positive, while well, the positive over a positive. And if we are taking the absolute value of something that we know is positive, then that means we can just eliminate the absolute value. We can say this is now the function natural log of x over 1 plus x squared if x is greater than 0. So let's take this case first, and then we'll take the case in a minute of when x is less than 0 and see what happens there. So here, uh, to find an absolute max or, um, or absolute max, absolute min, local max, local min, we're just going to need to take a derivative. So f prime of x is equal to the derivative of natural log of x over 1 plus x squared. Well, the natural log of u, its derivative is 1 over u. Well, 1 over a fraction is just like taking the reciprocal of it. So that'll be 1 plus x squared over x. So there's 1 over u. And then times du dx. So that means take the derivative of x over 1 plus x squared using the quotient rule. So that'll be 1 plus x squared times 1 minus the derivative of 1 plus x squared, which is 2x times your numerator, which is just x, all over 1 plus x squared squared. And it's a little bit of a mess. But if we simplify it down, it shouldn't be too terrible. Um, first of all, we have a 1 plus x squared in the numerator and a 1 plus x squared in the denominator that can cancel. So we're still going to be left with that x and that 1 plus x squared in the denominator. But in the numerator, we've now just got 1 plus x squared minus 2x squared, which is 1 minus x squared or 1 minus x, 1 plus x. And for this, if we're looking at when does this equals 0, and when is this undefined, uh, first off, it must equal 0 if x equals 1 or x equals negative 1. And then this would be undefined if x equals 0 because of the x in the denominator. And then that 1 plus x squared in the denominator, well, that's never going to equal 0, so we don't need to worry about that. So it looks like we've got three potential critical values. But then we got to go back and think, what was our restriction here? Well, it said x had to be greater than 0. Well, 
zero is not greater than zero, so I'm not going to include that because that's our that's not even part of the domain of my function. And negative one is not greater than zero. That's not part of this restriction I put on the domain here. So the only one we really actually get here is x equals one. So now what we need to do is we need to go back through and we need to do the same thing for when x is less than zero. So if x is less than zero, that's going to tell us that x over one plus x squared is less than zero which means that the thing inside of our absolute value from the original function is negative. And what happens when we have a negative value inside an absolute value? We can clear the absolute value by taking the opposite of what's inside. So this would tell us that f of x is equal to the natural log of negative x over one plus x squared. And from there, we'll just take a derivative f prime of x equals, again, it's natural log of u. So we'll have 1 over u, which in this case will be negative 1 plus x squared over x, and then times the derivative of negative x over 1 plus x squared, which is actually going to be exactly the same as what we had before, except we have a negative sign out in front of it. So before, when I got that all simplified out, um, it looked like a 1 minus x times a 1 plus x in the numerator after we work through all of this with a 1 plus x squared squared in the denominator. So 1 minus x, 1 plus x, and 1 plus x squared squared. And we can see that the negative in the first fraction and the negative in the second fraction just cancel each other out. And also a 1 plus x squared in the numerator cancels with one of the 1 plus x squareds in the denominator. And we have the exact same derivative that we had the other way around, which is equal to 0 if x is 1 or x is negative 1. And it's undefined still if x is 0. But once again, we'll note that our restriction was for this piece, x had to be less than zero, which doesn't include zero or one, but does include negative one. So we've got two critical values, x equals one and x equals negative one. If we go back to our original function, which was f of x equals the natural log of the absolute value of x over one plus x squared, and find f of 1, we get the natural log of 1 over 1 plus 1 squared, or the natural log of x. Um, normally, we don't really like to write natural log of log of half. Normally, we'll write this as the negative natural log of 2, which we can see by just rewriting it as natural log of 1 minus natural log of 2 using log rules. Knowing that natural log of 1 is 0, this is just negative natural log of 2. And when we try to evaluate f of negative 1, we'll end up with natural log of negative, or sorry, with the absolute value. <laughs> Let's see there. Of the absolute value of negative 1 over 1 plus negative 1 squared. And I really should have this inside of absolute values too, but since it was all positive, it didn't really matter. Uh, this becomes, again, the natural log of a half, which we know is negative natural log of 2. So now um, we know that our function has a diff continuity at 0, and it's got either a local max or a local minimum um, of negative ln 2 at both x equals 1 and at x equals negative one. Uh, so what we're going to do now here at this point is uh, we're going to just take a look at a value uh, just to the left of one. So let's say f of one half. And if I looked at f of one half, we're going to have the natural log of one half over 
one plus one fourth when we square one half, which is going to give us one half over five fourths, which is going to give us one half times four fifths, which is well clearly two fifths, a value that is less than um, like the natural log of two fifths. Forgot my natural log all the way along there. Throw that in there. Natural log, natural log, natural log. And the natural log of two fifths, um, that's like the natural log of two minus the natural log of five. And that's going to be a value that is less than negative natural log of two. And if I were to plug in something a little more than one half, like let's say we plugged in two, um, f of two is going to give us the natural log of, again, two over five, which is again going to be natural log of two bits. And it's also going to be less than the negative natural log of two. And so it looks like these values that we're looking at here um, are maxima, because if we were to use similar values with the negative one um, on, the, on both sides of negative one, we'd find that we'd get the same thing. Um, so we're going to not have an absolute, um, or, sorry, we're just going to have this minimum or maximum here um, of negative ln 2 at x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. And it's a local max, but it also ends up being an absolute max because we can see that on both sides of these values, we are less than the value at our maximum. And if we were to go in to Desmos and take a look at this, we've got the natural log of the absolute value of x over 1 plus x squared. Close my absolute value. And it wants me to put parentheses around that. And we've got our parentheses around that. And so we can see what our graph looks like. We are decreasing towards an asymptote here at zero. And we are at our local maxima here at one and at negative one with values of negative ln two and positive ln two. We can see if I were to plug in over here, natural log of two, we can see that that is 0.693, which is exactly what we got there at those two. going to be it for today.